Welcome, members and guests, to the January 29th program in the City Club of Eugene, The Neglected Few, Students of Color and Their Experience on the UO Campus. I'm James Baldock, City Club President. Our sponsors today are the Network Charter School, Sacred Earth Botanicals, and Capella Market. Special thanks go to KPFF Consulting Engineers for supplying our office space, and to KLCC Radio for airing these programs at 6.30 on Monday nights and archiving the podcast on their website. We'd also like to thank Community Television of Lane County for televising recent City Club programs Monday through Friday at noon, Saturday at 10.30 a.m., and Sunday at 9 p.m. We host nearly 50 original nonpartisan issue programs, and today is our 17th program in our 2015-2016 programming year. If you believe with us that civic engagement is the lifeblood of democracy, please join us. We welcome donors, sponsors, members, volunteers, and students, anyone who has a stake in community life. Today's host is Lisa Arkin, who will be introducing the speakers and the first questioner. The title of today's program is The Neglected Few, Students of Color and Their Experience on the U of O Campus. Our guest speakers today are Perla Alvarez. She is the internal director of MECHA. She is a uh, senior majoring in ethnic studies. Dante Haruna is our second speaker. He is from the Queer Trans People of Color Union, and he is majoring in music with a focus on the vocal arts. Our third speaker is Shanice Curry. She is with the Black Women of Achievement and the U of O Black Student Task Force. She's a double major, both in planning and public policy, as well as ethnic studies with a focus on public health. Our for fourth speaker is Gerald Jakabowski. He's the co-director of the Asian Pacific American Student Union. He's a junior majoring in economics, and he is also a member of the Collegiate Christian Fellowship Leadership Team. Our first questioner today will be Dr. Charles Martinez. Dr. Martinez is the department head and professor of educational methodology, policy, and leadership in the U of O College of Education. I also wish to give special thanks to Samara Mokaya, the community outreach coordinator with the U of O Multicultural Center, and Joel Iboa, the environmental justice community outreach manager with Beyond Toxics, who were instrumental in helping to organize today's program. This panel of University of Oregon undergraduate student leaders represents diverse organizations dedicated to supporting students of color on campus. The four student representatives will discuss how being members of a minority group can impact their ability to learn and grow on the university campus. Thank you for being here, speakers. So hi everyone, I will be the first one speaking. My name is Perla Alvarez and my pronouns are she, her, hers. So, so please use those pronouns whenever uh, referring to myself. Um, I want to start us off by doing an activity. Uh, we're going to do the unity clap. I will explain what that is. Um, in Mecha, that's how we start and end our meetings. So I hope you can join me. We are going to start clapping, and we're going to clap to the rhythm of our hearts. So first, slow, and then we're going to speed it up, and then it's going to end very rapid. OK? OK, so we're going to start. Okay, so um, the unity clap was used during uh, the whole Uniting Farm Workers movement back in the 60s, and it was a form of communication between the farm workers, the Filipino farm workers, and also Latino Mexicanos uh, farm workers, and it stands for one down, one fall, and it is a way to show the people power and the, un and the unity between the oppressed groups. Um, so this is, again, a way to teach and pass down the knowledge 
um, of all those people who fought um, in the 60s so we could all attend to school and have the rights that we have now. Um, again, my name is Perla Alvarez and I am a third year student at the University of Oregon studying ethnic studies and I have two minors. One of them is planning public policy and management and the other one is Spanish. I am an immigrant. I, am, Im I immigrated from Mexico in 2006 and I am a first generation student. That means that I will be the first one in my family to graduate uh, from college, hopefully next year. Um, I am the internal director of the Movimiento Estudiantil Chicanao de Aslan, or MECHA, which is one of the uh, Latin organizations on campus, um, and is one of two, actually, Latino student organizations on campus. Um, it is primarily for those who identify as Chicanos, but I know a lot of our students do not identify as Chicanos. Um, so there is a lot of Mexican American students in our community in Mecha and leaving out a lot of other Latino students on campus. So that's that. Uh, Mecha has been on campus for over 50 years. We just celebrated our 50th anniversary two years, university, anniversary two years ago. Uh, we focus on community building and advocacy and teaching our younger generations about higher education because we believe that education is very powerful. Um, they can take away your rights, but they cannot take our education. Um, so uh, this year, our membership in Mecha has doubled from the last year. We have about 60 to 70 active members, and it is a very hard group to manage. We have never had this many members before. Um, and this shows that the Latino population is growing in Oregon and in the United States. We try to educate our um, students on issues that we usually don't learn in institutions, in the university. We teach them about ethnic studies. We teach them about um, political issues, current political issues that are going on, on not only with the Latino community, but also with other communities um, of color on campus and nationally and even internationally. We, we also teach them about, of course, the Chicano movement and indigenous roots. It, it, it's also very important for us to learn about where we come from and learn about colonialism and all these theories. Um, that, again, we usually do not learn in the core curriculum in elementary school, in kindergarten, in high school, even at the university. If a lot of our students are not taking ethnic studies courses, so they have a vague understanding about how oppression works, how, like all the different movements, our own history. Uh, the Mecha has two very powerful programs. One of them is the Raza Unida Youth Conference. It happens every year, and we bring about 500 students on, uh, to campus to experience higher education and to learn about the admission process and what it takes to attend the university. Uh, the students we bring are Chicano, Latino identified, and we do, um, we do have a budget for that, but it, it's not enough. So we have to fundraise to always um, have the conference happen. We do have some support from the multicultural person at the Office of the Dean of Students, but this person is overworked. Uh, this person not only supports Mecha, but supports all the students' organizations on campus. This person attends um, a lot of our meetings and is just very stressful for them. Um, it, the Raza Unida Youth Conference is very important to us because, like I mentioned, one of the uh, Mecha's mission is to teach our younger generations about education and the power of education and the uh, power of giving back to our communities and being, um, having representation in um, in bodies where decisions are made. Uh, so, like, again, we can give back to our community. We also have the GANAS program, and that's where we go to Kelly Middle School, and this program has about 30 students. We go every Monday and Wednesday to mentor and tutor, and tutor these um, students. 
Uh, we also bring them about three to five times a year to the University of Oregon, so they can also have exposure to the uh, to the campus, to higher education, and just to more mentorships. Um, a lot of our students have expressed that the students at the University of Oregon are like older brothers and sisters to them. Uh, we also serve as support to them because we know that a lot of their parents work um, for long periods of time and they don't have time to like, you know, um, like they don't have a lot of time for their students and help them with homework so that's why we're there for we help them with homework we um, we also teach them about Chicano and Latino movements and other movements um, bring ethnic studies to the to uh, to their knowledge so why am I mentioning these two programs it is mentioning that um, that we as machistas as students we're doing the the job of the institution we are spreading, we are recruiting uh, Latino and Chicano students to campus. We're bringing them, we're teaching them about what it takes to come to the University of Oregon or even higher ed. And it is not our job. That is why the admissions office is there for, or other offices on campus there are for. And don't get me wrong, we love doing it. We love going out there and teaching our young um, our young people about the struggles that we've been through, the struggle of like filling out FAFSA and not knowing what some of the terms there mean and having to go ask for help on how to fill it out. A lot of our students are also undocumented and they don't know, or their parents are undocumented and they don't know that they can't get financial aid. So we try to break those barriers for the students. Um, we do get a stipend from the ASU or the Associated Students of the University of Oregon within their budget, but it's only $55 a month. And we usually do more than that. We work more than that, uh, putting these conferences on, going to the Kelly Middle School transportation. All of that money comes from our budget. We did have, uh, used to have a graduate student position that was actually um, paid by, I think, the Office of Equity and Inclusion but the, then that support is continue. We don't have any support um, for the GANAS program or the, uh, or the RUIC. And we would like to continue being there for the students, for our younger students, um, so they can you know, have access to higher education. Uh, and we can't do it all alone. You know? It's like another job, but we're only getting paid $50 a month. It's not enough. And, um, so one of my recommendations would be more, more support for MECHA or students. Seeing, you know, reaching out to us, we tried, you know, reaching out to administration and um, asking them for, you know, more support, institutional support from them, especially funding. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, and I have a lot of other demands. We've had these conversations in Mecha. They would like to see more translators during introduction at the University of Oregon. A lot of our parents just drop us off during introduction, getting introduced to the University of Oregon, you know, that orientation program that happens during the summer. Um, and our parents just drop us off and they go home and they have no idea, you know, what goes around at the, like, the U of O, we're gonna be safe. You know, how, how this is going to be our new, new home for a lot of us. And, you know, they, they don't know. They've never been through a university before, the system before. Um, so, la Mechista, Latinos, we would really like to see Latino caucus spaces um, at the University of Oregon, where admissions people, hopefully, they could, like, break down the language, like, the financial language and just speaking with our parents, telling us that we're going to be safe, that we do have support, that, you know, things that Latino parents don't know. Um, <laughs> so that, that's my little speech for today. If you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dante Haruna. Uh, I'm a fifth year senior at the U of O, music major. I'm about to graduate this year. I'm really excited and really nervous. <laughs> um, and I'm here representing Kiripak, which is the queer, trans, people of color uh, student union on the U of O. Um, for anybody that's not
quite aware or sure of what uh, the word queer stands for. Um, I'm sure y'all have probably heard it, but so uh, more recently, um, queer has been a word that the uh, LGBTQ community has reclaimed. Um, it definitely in, in the past has meant things that are odd, of course, is one definition, or has been used as an insult. Um, but in, in the contemporary world, um, it's been reclaimed as a word to kind of describe an umbrella uh, of ideas of different sexualities and genders, um, particularly those that fall outside of the norm. So like when we talk about sexuality, I think often we think about gay or straight, this very like binary uh, model. Um, or when we talk about gender, we think of men and women or males and females. Um, but there's a lot of folks who do not fit within those two ideas or um, maybe fit in between or fit out or some combination of different things. So uh, just for example, uh, when it comes to sexuality, there's people can identify as bisexual, they can identify as asexual, which is not experiencing sexual attraction, they can identify as uh, pansexual, um, which would mean being attracted to many different genders, not just men and women, but transgender folks, gender nonconforming folks. Um, and when it comes to gender, uh, people can be third gender, people can be agender. Agender would be not, d not feeling like you have a gender. Um, and people can be gender fluid or gender queer. And really all this is to say is that gender is how you present yourself to the world and how the world might perceive you. Um, but ultimately it's coming from an internal place of how you feel in your body and how you want to present that body. Um, so anyway, that's just a little like terminology. Um, uh, I first wanted to, oh, so I'm sorry, my name is Dante, my pronouns are he, him, and his, and they, them, theirs. Um, and I first want to go into just a little bit about Cutie Pock as a group, a little bit about its history. Um, so Cutie Pock was formed in 2011, uh, so very recently, um, and it was done informally uh, from a group of students who identify as queer, trans, people of color. Um, and basically the main reason that they formed that group was because in the queer spaces that existed on campus, that still exist on campus, uh, they didn't feel safe, they didn't feel comfortable, they didn't feel like their voices and concerns were being explicitly heard and met. Um, and those, those uh, resources that I'm talking about are the LGBTQIA, uh, which is the student union, and the LGBT ESSP, um, which is more like the department uh, uh, professional staff component uh, to the QA. Um, so yeah, it was formed in 2011. Students felt like they needed a space where they could be both queer and trans and people of color um, and have that specific support. It was really informal. Uh, it, it was a very small group and it's been a very small group of a handful of students uh, and it's mostly been a space for people to just decompress and really just hang out um, and the importance of having that space to just kind of be together and, and hang out, so to speak. Um, was vital for students to feel like they could validate each other and that their experiences that they weren't alone. Um, as of right now, this year the group is not together. Um, there's members, but they've all graduated. Uh, the group was officially recognized by the ASUO in 2015 and they have a budget, but again, there's not many students that are around. Uh, the ones that formed it have graduated and the ones that are here are kind of scattered into different groups. So for example, I identify as queer and Asian American. Um, I'm a part of the Multicultural Center and in my opinion, the Multicultural Center does a good job of, of creating that space. Um, but the QA, the LGBTQA, for example, uh, is mostly white dominated. So it's, it's a space where personally, like when I go in there, I don't feel comfortable to like talk about POC issues because sometimes I think it's disregarded. People uh, tend to want to focus on their issues as white, queer, and trans students, which is needed. Absolutely, that's needed. Um, but, but POC students also need their own space. Um, and, and there are cutie sock students, queer trans students of color um, in various other groups or non-groups just floating around the U of O. Um, so we're here uh, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but we need, we need a lot more support in order to feel safe and comfortable in pursuing our educations and our careers and whatnot. Um, so with that in mind, cutie pock is not currently in function right now. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we don't have support. So. Uh, but first, I kind of just want to like share with y'all like my personal life experiences and journey, just to give you that framework, and then I'll go into demands at the end. Um, but I was born and raised in Oregon. Uh, I grew up in Medford, Oregon for about half of my life. Um, and then I moved to the coast of Oregon, uh, Bandon, 
um, which is a small 3,000 people town. Um, and so that was where I did most of my uh, uh, education. Um, and my experiences growing up in Oregon have been very, very difficult. Um, so, I, like, to be honest, like, I'm still kind of coming to terms with a lot of the stuff that I internalized. Um, but, for example, growing up in school, um, being both queer, not being exactly sure what my gender identity was, uh, and really just wanting to explore that, um, there was like a threshold of, of time where it was okay for me to, you know, dress like a girl or act like a girl or, or do these things that was just thought of as like, oh, that's just a boy being a little kid kind of a thing. That was what people kind of, the message people gave me. Um, but I never viewed it that way. I just viewed it as like, my mom has a cabinet of videos and I happen to like the Disney ones and the princesses looked cool. <laughs> um, and, you know, I wanted to wear scarves and, and sing and dance, which I still do. So, <laughs> um, but it wasn't a matter of like trying to like be anything or not be anything, it just was what I gravitated to. And then there came a point where it became very clear to me that other students in my school, that other parents and teachers um, around me started telling me that I needed to act like a boy and what that meant. Um, and I, I never understood why that was a thing. Like, I, it didn't make sense to me why I was being told that because I knew how it, what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't know what gender was. Um, but so I, for my personal sake, like, uh, I, had, I conformed to that. Um, and at the same time, I also started facing a lot of the racism, a lot of the racist comments and microaggressions that, uh, in my opinion, occurs very heavily in Oregon as well as in this country. Um, and I think a lot of the times those comments aren't done with uh, bad intentions. I think a lot of it's just ignorance. I think a lot of it's just people, that's kind of like the, what our culture produces in terms of media, in terms of um, uh, things that we carry from our parents and in our, our previous communities and that we teach to our kids. Um, but for example, like especially in high school is probably the hardest time. Um, I had to navigate, and this is where inter intersectionality comes in, and that just means like being queer and something else, or being Asian American and something else, for example. Um, I had to navigate all those different identities because, for example, if I'm sitting in class and I happen to cross my legs under my desk, then people would be like, oh, you're being really gay. So I couldn't cross my legs. And then if I, like, raise my hand to answer a question, then people are like, oh, you're really smart, you're really Asian, kind of a thing. So then I didn't want to, like, answer the teacher because I didn't want to be too Asian. Um, but then people thought of me as, but then teachers would give me pressure and say like, I know you can do better, why aren't you participating? It's like, I don't feel safe to participate. I don't wanna raise my hand, I don't wanna be here. Um, and so a lot of my high school experience, to be honest, was me just kind of zoning out throughout the entire day so I could just get home and, and shut my door to the world when I got home, which is what I did. I, I lived most of my life after school just in my room. Um, and so it didn't feel safe. I didn't connect with my education. I didn't really connect with my peers. That's not to say there weren't good things, like there were good things, but, um, and I came to the U of O and it, it's just been this ongoing, I'm still going through it right now, this process of deconstructing that internalized stuff that I, for 22 years of my life, pitted against myself, these messages that I was being given um, and thinking things were my fault. And that really, really inhibited my ability to focus. It inhibited my ability to um, care to understand why what I was learning was something that I could uh, understand and take for my own and do something with that. Um, school has always just kind of been this place where I, I, I get through to get my degree and, and then get out. Um, and so uh, what that brings me to is I think the importance of supporting cutie sock students, again queer trans student of color, students of color, um, because we need to feel safe, we need to feel like we can see ourselves um, in positions of power to know that we can get far. Um, so again, for example, I'm a music major and the music school here is very white dominated. And I was actually thinking about this yesterday, but um, in my voice studio class, you know, it's like all our voice students of a teacher gets together and we sing for each other once a week. Um, so there's this freshman student and she's a young uh, white female identified person um, and you know, it's week four of the term, and I, I noticed when she was singing, like, just how amazing her technique had improved, uh, how much her technique ha had improved. Um, and, you know, I kind of projected onto the future. I was just imagining, like, her going through the next three or four years of schooling, and she has a lot of white female students that are 
on the stage in this school performing, being amazing, being fabulous opera singers. Um, she has a lot of strong white female teachers, uh, not just within the school and not just within the state or the country, but within the opera world and within the classical world, within the musical world. And absolutely that's necessary for, for folks who identify as women to have that representation. Um, but for people who are either not white and or are uh, not gender conforming or, or conforming to what society expects, it's really hard to have energy and to, to have care. Um, I, I just, I mean, I think I wonder what it would have been like if I had a queer Asian American teacher, if I had other queer Asian Americans on the stage, uh, even within pop music, which is what I like, and I don't, I don't see them. <laughs> you know, so it's, it, in a lot of ways, it feels isolating, it feels really alone, um, and it's hard to know that I can do something, even though, like, intellectually, it's like, yes, I can, like, I know that's possible, but in terms of spirit and emotion, um, it's a whole different battle. So. I'm talking a lot about myself. I want to get into my demands. I'm just trying to give you a personal example. Um, so the demands I'm about to kind of suggest is a collection of ideas that I've come up with and that I've also come up with with my peers who identify as cutie sock. Um, these are current students uh, who have their own personal experiences at the U of O. Um, but one of the main things, just like the big picture, is just to have a physical space where we can go that is specific to our needs. Um, we need mental health counselors who we feel like we can go to and specifically talk about our issues. Uh, again, for example, I have a, a white male counselor who's really great. He's helped me out with a lot of stuff, but I don't feel comfortable talking about race because I brought it up and I can tell he's uncomfortable. And so I, I don't engage in that conversation. And that's a huge component of my mental health right now. Um, at the same time, uh, that, that kind of thing is, is similar for a lot of students, Chris, uh, queer POC. Um, when it comes to advisors, academic advisors, asking for help, connecting with their teachers, not just about the material, but also what's it going to be like for me to try to have a career in this field as my identity, considering the fact that we live in the society where I don't really see my identity and, and my identity tends to just be kind of ignored and pushed to the side. Um, I think we also need a queer resource center. Um, PSU has one. I think OSU has one. Uh, they have meeting spaces, lounge spaces, libraries, computer labs, they have staff and faculty, they have advisors, they have mentors, um, and really all I'm just trying to say is that they have a, a support group, a, a network, a place to go, a building, a space, um, where they know that they can go to someone and talk about just like the quote unquote normal things of like, I need a job, I need to go to school, I need to do this, but they know that they can trust that there's a person who has that deeper specific context of being queer and trans and POC. Um, and so there's a lot more demands, um, cultural competency. So I think having teachers who, in my opinion, it's not just enough to have teachers, and this is what they've done, is to just have teachers kind of sit down at the beginning of the year and go through like a couple hour long course on how to be culturally competent because on the one hand, like I think it takes a lot more work to get things intellectually because there's a lot of stuff there's a lot of stuff in, in, in all of this that needs to be hashed out but there's also a huge emotional component um, and I think when that emotional component is missing um, it's just it's easy to kind of forget that queer trans people of color are in existence and that they need help so intentionally hiring teachers and faculty that can understand that framework what uh, specifically intentionally hiring queer and trans people of color in positions as administrators, as faculty members, as instructors, as GTFs, um, so that students know that they can go to someone to have those conversations and to voice those concerns on top of how do I get a career, how do I navigate life, how do I get a job, how do I you know, pay my bill or whatever it might be. Um, I don't know how much time I have. Um, and also to, to focus on getting those people into the ESSP, again, the LGBTQ ESSP, which is the administrative portion of the, of the queer resource on campus. Um, having a space for students to come in, so, and having advisors and mentors and student interns that they know they can come to and talk to and, and say, hey, like, I'm struggling right now as a queer POC, queer and trans POC, because this happened. And just to have that validation is, it makes, a huge difference. Um, I guess I'll just end with saying that, um, you know, queer and trans people of color and students of color are out there right now, sitting in the classroom right now, uh, being taught whatever they're being taught, um, and they're going through a lot of these things. And 
and I think there continues to be a lack of representation within our society for those people. And for me personally, like as I try to navigate and go forward and gain my own empowerment, I try to think of ways of how can I not forget those people that maybe aren't at that place or don't have that. And so I think from you all, what would be extremely helpful, um, I think it's one thing to have conversations like this, and I'm very grateful that we have this conversation. Um, and I think more needs to be done too. I think these conversations need to continue to happen, not just happen once because this stuff is not going away. We're not going away. We've been here since day one of humanity <laughs> and we're gonna be, be here since the end of humanity. And so um, I think for you, I know that's kind of like philosophical and cheesy, but that's who I am. So um, if, yeah, if we can just focus on putting pressure on administrators, pressure in the sense of just having those conversations, demanding that we continue to, to meet like this, demanding that we continue to form committees um, with you all as supporters and donors and people who have power um, to be able to influence those in power at the U of O to create spaces, to create resources, to, cre to, to channel funds into queer and trans student color because it's not just about serving a smaller population on the U of O campus, it's about changing our entire culture of our entire nation. Um, fun fact, uh, 52 percent of the zero to five year olds in the US right now are people of color so things are changing and and we need your support our young generation needs your support so please donate please uh, demand that we have committees please demand that we continue these conversations and do action and when we all call for y'all's help please show up and support us My name is Shanice Curry. Um, I'm a senior at the University of Oregon. I'm a double major in 3 p.m. in ethnic studies, and my focus is public health. I was born in North Portland, and I'm a first-generation college student. I currently serve as the director of the Black Women of Achievement, and I'm also a leader on the Black Student Task Force. My involvement with these student organizations started as a response to um, me seeking community out on campus. Um, instead, I was actually met with a lack of support and anti-black racism. So anti-black racism is something that has been permeating our campus since 1917. And that's when the UO admitted his first black student, Mabel Bird. Mabel Bird was forced to work as a domestic worker in the home of a professor because she was forbidden to live on the campus and also in the community. This is one of the legacies of Matthew Didi, one of the people that we honor as the, the father of our institution here. Somehow we excuse his explicit support of exclusionary laws that banned black citizens from entering um, the state of Oregon up until 1926. We excuse the fact that Friendly Hall is still, ha still has two separate entrances to accommodate white students from Bobby Robinson and Charles Williams. They were two, two black athletes at the University of Oregon. We excuse the fact that in the midst of the Black Lives Matter movement, as churches are being terrorized and as young black college age students are being murdered at unprecedented rates, we still do not have a safe place to congregate here on our campus. Today, the university states that we value our diversity and seek to foster equity and inclusion in a welcoming, safe, and respectable community. As a student of color, and furthermore, as a black woman, I understand that to not be true. The university's commitment to diversity is insincere propaganda. We put images of black students next to Asian students and Latinos and sell a concepts that we ourselves do not believe in, that we're not invested in. Diversity here on our campus has always rejected the incorporation of black students. And it's time, at, and it's time that as a community we address this matter. Black students currently represent only 2% of, of our student population, while Hispanics and Latinos are projected to, to rise to 10% in fall 2016. Asian students are 6%, 6 and even what the UO classifies as non-resident aliens make up 11% of our student body. Black students still remain to be 2%. There are currently 3,274 international students on our campus and 472 black students. What excuses we have as an institution? The demographics in Oregon, finding college-ready black youth, but the problem with these excuses is, if that is the case, how is it that we have an overrepresentation of black students on our sports team, but an underrepresentation in our classrooms? Thursday, November 12th, the Black Women of Achievement organized a march of over 500 participants, led by allies and myself. The march was to stand in solidarity 
with, in solidarity with students at Mizzou, and it was also organized as an opportunity to raise awareness of the unique experience of black students here on our campus. We later formed the Black Student Task Force to advocate for the needs of those particular black students. Our work thus far, thus far has consisted of making visible the administration's previous and current shortcomings, publishing a list of demands, and engaging black students in community building in forms of, in forms of empowerment, something that has historically not been offered at our university. Our demands were released in November 17, November 17 2015, and adequate momentum has not been made. Our demands are fairly similar to the demands that were published by the BSU in 1968, only two years after they created the organization. It's shameful and equally disgraceful is the university's capitalizing of black bodies while, simultane while simultaneously dispelling them. We can no longer stand for it and we, continue, we will continue to increase lacking institutional support for black students on our campus. Racial and social justice is, simply, is not simply more black representation. It's shared power and equitable resources. We need reconstructive justice in which we reform the foundation of our institution to sincerely incorporate black students into its mission and reject the history of the lasting implications of anti-black racism on our campus and on our state and within our state. We recognize that our demands are not zero sum, they are positive sum in which they create a win-win situation for the university and it's vital for the safety and success of our black students that they are met immediately. If the university does not implement our demands, which could be found on the demands.org alongside um, other um, institutions, uh, we will continue to mobilize and we have. Um, my, recommend my recommendation for you all today um, is that you review our demands. As I said, they're on the demands.org and we also have them published on our personal website. Um, and pledge your support by contacting UO administration and the Board of Trustees and letting them know um, that we need more black representation and that we also need support for our black organizations. So we just hold them accountable to their mission and understand that black students at our university are indispensable. And to really be committed to diversity and to really be committed to um, an environment that welcomes all communities and promotes safety and cultural development, we have to incorporate black students and historically we have not. So, thank you. Hello, my name is Gerald Jacobowski. I commonly go by G, just like the letter. Um, <laughs> I'm the co-director of the Asian Pacific and American Student Union at the University of Oregon, and I'm also on the leadership team of the Collegiate Christian Fellowship. Um, I believe that my identity as a Pacific Islander and my faith in Christ have played such a developmental role in my development over the last four years that uh, it plays such a big impact that I deserve to talk about both of them. A uh, quick summary on what, Ap what Apazu is and where it came from is we were founded in the early 1970s under a different name but we emerged from a time where there was a demand for ethics studies program because beforehand there were no ethics studies programs at the universities. Um, so a coalition of people of color came together and these, pe these people, what they wanted to do is they had the mission statement and the values to have their voices heard, break chains of injustice, and provide an authentic perspective on their view of life in the U.S. Uh, the Eugene community that emerged from this time is known as known as the Pacific and Asian Community Alliance, also known as PACA. Uh, Apazu it has, shares the same mission statement and values as PACA, but we are more university-based. Um, so we deal with students. What we do is we've created, molded, and we shaped social justice advocates and supported other marginalized communities through going through conferences, uh, standing in solidarity with them. And what we currently do is we currently educate students to provide, by providing a space for them to get in touch with not only their roots, but also by creating awareness on the injustices that they have faced and that they will continue to face um, through their time. I think an important thing that I want to highlight that my staff, what we do is, at, in Apazu, is we focus on not only educating others on social justice with the intellectual realm, but we also focus on changing the heart. Because in my opinion, the heart and the mind, they're connected. Um, so you gotta have to have a change in heart to change your mind, the way you think, to change your actions. And so an example of that um, 
to sum it up, is it's not enough to know what the right thing is to do, but you have to be willing to understand why it, it is the right thing to do, and you have to be willing to be bold to live that out in your life. So an example would be uh, a lot of times uh, Asian American Pacific Islander students get the question, where are you from? Uh, and then we'll answer, and again, we'll get the, the, uh, the question back, no, but where are you really from? And what that, as frustrating as that is, what that demonstrates is that because the, the way that I look, the color of my skin, you, uh, that person has a bias that thinks that I don't belong in the U.S., I'm not a true American, and that I'm from elsewhere. Uh, and that can be really frustrating. But what happens what we seek to do is we aim to transfer, uh, to transfer the person's thinking, that instead of recognizing that, yeah, that is bias and discrimination, is that the transfer, the, for them to no longer think about it as not to say that because what their peers will think about them, but to transfer that into something where that they realize when I say those things and I reduce a person to a stere uh, basic stereotype, that I'm harming that person. So what we do is we create social justice advocates that are not only able to speak within the Asian, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander community, but we also take the extra step in creating leadership roles where uh, our community is able to influence others in other communities which there's a famous quote that goes it's not the oppressed job to educate the oppressors but because we believe social justice is something that needs to be focused on now we actually take up the mantle to do that um, just by some personal experiences that have happened at the uvo both as an aapi a and as a uh, christian uh you hear a lot of microaggressions for example uh people will be like man your english is great and a lot of times we'll be like yeah it is great because it's my native language <laughs> thank you very much uh, you hear in classrooms, especially in science classrooms, uh, do you really, like you'll get mocking, do you really expect prayer to do anything? Or if you have a one tr a belief in a one true absolute, truth absolute, like you don't belong in my classroom. And what that does is that creates a barrier between the student and education. And it creates a community that right off the bat doesn't feel inclusive and actually feels unwelcoming and alienates that student. So my question is, if UO faculty is supposed to support their purposes, visions, values, and mission statements of the University of Oregon, why are people feeling this way in these communities? And why are we feeling unwelcome? So my request to the UO admin is that they need to reevaluate what their teaching criteria is. It's no longer suitable enough to just hire based on what your teaching credentials are and what you've done in the past, but there needs to be an extra aspect where can, potential candidates are evaluated on their knowledge of social justice or the, having the passion to continue learning social justice and eventually become a, a mentor to students. Uh, what this looks like is I think there's five categories that should be evaluated on. It's character, chemistry, competency, culture, and calling. A potential candidate should have the character to uphold the UO values and mission statements. Uh, a potential candidate should also have chemistry that they should Professors in one department should blend well with the professors in another department and be able to focus on carrying out that social justice aspect in their, in their curriculum. Third, competency. Not only should the professor have the ability to teach uh, in whatever field of study that they're teaching in, but they should have the competency of knowing what it means to have privileges, what it's like that the, uh, what people struggle through, um, what it's like to have intersectionality and recognize that there are privileges given by some identities, and in, in some identities, there are, you don't receive those privileges. Uh, fourth is culture. If the UO wants to maintain a culture of inclusive and safety, these potential candidates should also fit that culture. And lastly, they should have a calling. You shouldn't be hiring, we shouldn't be hiring professors who are there because they want to look like, they want to work at the UVO, um, they're there for the, the money. What, we need is professors who want to educate students, who want to be mentors, and who want to continue pushing the social justice conversation. And so we recognize that this takes time. And even though it's needed now, we do recognize it takes time. And we recognize that, yeah, the UO is a multi-billion dollar company. And that comes with, I'm sure, a bunch of issues. I've never managed a multi-billion dollar company, so I wouldn't know. But my point is, is if your value at the UVO states that we value our diversity and seek to foster equity and inclusion in a welcoming and safe and respectful community, that that value should be upheld no matter what the resources are going to take. And so the reason I believe that this would work is because uh, it's, it's no surprise that first year professors have great inf influence on students. Um, the thing with first year professors is that they shape what 
first year students perceive their education is to be over the next four years. So if a first year student walks in and thinks that over the, ne the course of the next few weeks, or sorry, the next few years at their school, that the only scientists there are are white males, they're going to be conditioned by their environment to believe that's the truth. However, if you have a professor that understands um, that the scientists that have contributed from multiple backgrounds, um, uh, most of backgrounds, beliefs, um, you, you actually educate that person as a whole um, in a much more positive way to, uh, and also continue to educate them on these social justice issues. So in my closing remarks, yeah, I am proud to be a duck and I'm proud at the University of Oregon and I do think it's a top tier school. However, this is also the same reason why I hold it to such a high standard because I believe that these changes matter because the people matter the issues matter and change must occur. And I believe that if we do work together and we continue to tackle these issues, um, just like in Amos 524 it reads, justice will roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. So thank you. I'm going to stand over here so that the speaker is not blocking my head. Um, my name is Charles Martinez. As Lisa indicated, I'm a professor uh, and department head in the College of Education at the University of Oregon. I'm also the director of a research center at the university, the Center for Equity Promotion. Um, and probably important in part for this conversation, I served for seven years as a vice president for institutional equity at the University of Oregon from 2005 to 2011. Um, and I, I, I first want to um, acknowledge the courage of students um, to share their voices this way. Um, so first let's give them another um, round of applause. I will tell you that in my experience this kind of forum is dangerous. And is dangerous in part because we in the audience have the potential to simply have the, the student voice in this context sort of be on display for us, like it's an exhibit for us to attend to, to maybe feel a moment of pain or a, shed a tear or feel a connection and then sort of move on in our lives. And that is a disservice to this voice. And behind this voice should be a sense of urgency that often is not in this conversation, but I feel it when I hear them. Because this voice, and you heard it in their comments, has been the voice with us, with this institution, since its founding. So what does it mean for us to sit here patiently listening to it without any sense of urgency? So to honor that voice, what I would encourage all of us to do in the audience is to feel some urgency that the courage it takes to share their uncensored views with this audience is, a, is not just a call to listen, it's a call to action. So I want to make sure I, I say that out loud. Um, the University of Oregon is a microcosm. So as we're sitting here in a, in a broader community conversation, we might be thinking, oh, that's what's happening at the university. But this is Oregon. This is Eugene. And what students experience on our campus is very much like what people of color experience in a broader context. So that makes it on all of us to act. This is not a University of Oregon only issue. It is a community issue. And the kinds of experiences I've, I've dealt with at the University of Oregon often have reflected a, a set of broader structural problems that reflect on us as a state and us as a broader community. And that's part of that, that call to action. We have to feel this urgency in our response to these students. And what I, what I would like to ask of us and of our students is the first question, is, to, is in framing this as a community issue, uh, we can look at demands that are likely to impact the structure over the long term. And I think those are critical. And the kinds of demands that have been put forward by students here, and if you go on uh, demands.org and read those demands, are very important for moving the institution forward. But the pace of change in the institution is really slow. In fact, you could make the case that an institution like higher education kind of depends on the slowness because, you know, these students will be gone in four or five years, right? 
So, what, so the pace of change in the institution tends to be slow. So urgency requires us to act in a more immediate way. And so as, you, as our panelists frame their demands in the form of what our community can do to help in, 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 to respond to the kind of urgency that these voices reflect. What can we do as a community that will make a difference now? Because the pain is real. And it's sort of like um, going to a doctor's office with a, an acute injury and having them stare at the injury and say, that looks terrible, but we're going to get a planning committee around this. We're going we're to develop a course of treatment. We'll go back to you in three or four months and tell you what we're going to do. Meanwhile, you're saying, deal with this injury right now. I'm not leaving the office till my bleeding stops. Let's feel that urgency and let's hear some things that this community can do to support our students and our community um, in, a, in a more immediate way. So when it comes to an immediate um, action, I do believe that making uh, communities and planning is an important thing. But before we get into that, I think a big thing is is that you, or, or everyone here, like you've heard what we had to say, and we appreciate you listening to us. And um, I feel like my fellow panelists will agree with that. Uh, but it's not enough, just enough to hear and listen to what we have to say, but it's to take that to your heart. And I believe you, uh, to focus on what we're saying, how that interacts with what you value and what your beliefs are. Because if you value and believe what we say and believe that there needs to be a change for like, a push for social justice and a pressuring like, of um, these injustices that go on, that's going to transfer to your feet and you're going to go out and do something about it. However, if, there, if there's somewhere along the way that that line breaks like, and maybe I'm going to be bold and say that there are people who are listening in who don't feel the same way that many of us feel. Um, I challenge you at, right now to examine what you, like, what you value, what you believe, um, and to really examine that on your heart. And maybe like, it's a change in heart that needs to occur right now with uh, many communities. I'm not sure what it is, but I think changing on what you believe and then be able to have that passion to carry out uh, the social justice in participating in these groups is what needs to occur now in, in the people. Anyone else? Anyone else want to make comments? Yeah, um, I would say that um, something that could happen immediately is uh, definitely try and understand what it means to be an ally. Educate your um, colleagues and your peers about what that actually means um, and pledging your support. So one of the things that we are doing is a campaign to make sure that the university knows that we're serious and that our allies are supporting us. So if you could send an email to President Schill or to the Board of Trustees and let them know, hey, I heard what is going on with black students on our campus and I want to know what you're doing to, to combat the anti-black racism and what can we do moving forward as an institution. So I think that's something that could immediately be um, um, taken into account. Also come and visit the University of Oregon more often. Come and have conversations with us. We do have a multicultural center, even though it's like a little square that is maybe like the, only this space right here. But there are students there. The students hang out there. Come and have conversations with us. Come and ask us, what, were you, what are you going through? How do you need support? Um, we have a lot of things to say. We just need to be asked to share. And just to piggyback off of what Shanice suggested, um, you know, it's Friday, it's the weekend, so I think uh, one easy thing y'all could do is to, you know, if you felt something in this interaction so far and, and you have uh, a sense of wanting to do something about it, I think you could take this weekend to consider writing a letter, like Shanice said, or an email to President Schill and the Board of Trustees. I think you all, as a, as a group of people, um, could even mobilize within yourself to schedule to go to the Board of Trustees whenever their next meeting is and show up and just simply say, hey, we had this panel and this is how we feel, this is what we think about mm -hmm. it, and we would like to stand in solidarity with these students and uh, show support that, sorry, I'm getting so distracted, um, and show support um, that they have immediate needs and that we want to help 
move those needs forward, whether it's through funding and or just giving us space. Uh, I think that's a really easy thing y'all could do. So email and then show up to the Board of Trustees and schedule to meet with President Schill. Um, I'm sure he'll we'll sit down with y'all and just tell him that you care. And then we, we, we know what we need and we just need people to kind of give us that space. So I, th I think forming that relationship could be helpful. All right, thank you. Today's topic is the neglected few, students of color and their experience at, on the UL campus. Our speakers today are uh, Perla Alavez, Dante Herrera, Shanice Curry, and Gerald Jacobosi. We'll break now for a few minutes and then return with members' questions. Okay. Can we move to the mic? All right, everyone. Let's quiet down. All right. So, we do not have enough time for any public questions for today, but the speakers have graciously said that you're free to approach them after I'm done these final remarks to answer any questions, and they can answer your questions for you. So I'd like to thank Perla Alvarez, Dante Herrera, Shanice Curry, and Gerald Jabowski for bringing clarity and vision to the City Club program, the neglected few, students of color, and their experience on the UO campus. And thanks again to our sponsors, the Network Charter School, Sacred Earth Botanicals, and Capella Market. Special thanks to Insight Hotel Management for hosting a session of the course Lane County's Economy and Employment, which City Club offers for teachers in collaboration with Lane ESD and Lane Workforce Partnership. We meet again on February 5th at the Downtown Athletic Club for academic excellence, student access, and the educational experience at the UO with Michael Schill, President of the University of Oregon. Lunches for this program can be ordered on the City Club's website or by contacting the office, and this concludes today's program. Thank you.